Hello, undead minions. Tis I, Antonieth Demikith. This is Pointy Hat, and it's Halloween! My favorite time of the year. Yes, I regret to inform you once again that I am one of those people that gets way too into Halloween. So for the month of October, we're gonna go for a spooky theme for all videos. And what's more spooky than... Liches. That's right, welcome to another installment of... Witch Lich. On Witch Lich, we take the concept of the Lich, the undead guy that simply refuses to die, we take a class, one of the D&D thingies you can be, and then we mash them together until we create a brand new type of Lich that you can terrorize your players with. We've already done a whole bunch of these, a whole gang, you might say. Money gang. We've done a Bard Lich, we've done a Sorcerer Lich, we've done a Druid Lich, we've done an Artificer Lich, and I think that this little Lich family of ours is looking mighty... squishy. So how about we add some muscle to this undead charcuterie board? Let's make a Barbarian Lich. In order to make a barbarian lich, we gotta understand what barbarians are first. What is their essence? The core of the class. It's literally the first word in the two word combo of barbarian lich, after all. See? Right there. I've made a whole video about barbarians, it even has an undead themed subclass in it for free. Go check it out if you haven't, or else. But here's barbarians in a nutshell. Barbarians are tanks. They have the highest HP, they don't wear armor, but none of those are what gives the barbarian class its identity. The core of the class is their signature ability, rage. Barbarians rely on their pure, unadulterated Engi mode to do literally everything they are good at. Through the power of refusing to go to anger management courses, barbarians are better tanks as they receive only half damage from slashing, piercing, and bludgeoning attacks when raging. They are better bruisers as they get bonuses to their damage when raging. They are better at mobility and crowd control when raging. Even their subclass abilities center around raging. Yes, even the worst ones isn't that right, barbarian berserker. Basically, a barbarian wants to be raging for most, if not all of combat to truly make the most of the class. That's what's the core of the Barbarian. That's what the essence of the class is. And if we take a step back, that's an interesting choice, isn't it? Someone that feels such a powerful anger that they literally become better death machines when they let themselves be controlled by that rage. If we want our Barbarian Lich to feel like a Barbarian, we gotta make the rage aspect of the class the core of the Lich itself. But since we're talking Liches, we might as well talk a little bit about boss battles, and specifically, big ones. Nothing can prepare an adventuring party for what it's like to fight a gargantuan monster. Large and even huge enemies are fearsome, until you fight the 14th one, but you can never get used to a gargantuan fight. Standing in front of an enemy the size of a city, and still deciding to try and bring it down, takes not just an adventurer, but a hero. Literally climbing the body of the monster that you intend to kill, locating its weak points, and through you and your companion's combined efforts, finally managing to bring the impossible beast down? That takes not just a hero, but a legend. Shame you can't really do that in D&D. Just kidding, you can! With Ryoko's Guide to the Yokai Realms. Ryoko's Guide is a proper D&D 5e book inspired by Eastern folklore and media. And it has plenty to offer all of you because it's a gargantuan book itself. I'm talking 350 pages gargantuan. That's... A lot. You get the gargantuan monster fighting system that helps you run fights against gargantuan creatures in the style of stuff like Shadow the Colossus, Attack on Titan, and other nerdy stuff with very hype music. And that's literally just the start. This thing has a whole elemental bender class inspired by... Well, you don't need me to tell you what inspired this. And not just that, five entire adventures that span multiple levels, 12 races, 12 subclasses, more than 10 adorable and not so adorable familiars, 12 ninja prosthetics inspired by that game that looks like it hurts to play and I'm too scared to pick up, but the trailer looks sick. There's even a system to do combo attacks as like a party together, like in Persona. So, I mean, yeah. It's got literally everything. And guess what? If this sounds like a thing for you, you are in luck. They reached 2 million. Everyone's talking about this, and they are celebrating it by giving people free dice. Yokai resin dice for free to all physical backers. The Kickstarter is almost over, so if any of the weeby references got your attention, or if jumping on top of a monster the size of a skyscraper to kill sounds like fun, the link to the Kickstarter is in the description of this very video. And now, back to Liches. Now, I know what you're thinking. Um, actually, a lich is an undead spellcaster. How could a barbarian be that? They can't cast spells when raging. And to that I say, yes, liches are spellcasters when they are wizards, or druids, or sorcerers, or bards, or artificers, or any other spellcasting class. But why can't a lich not be an undead martial combatant? 
If you're new, Litzes are somewhat of a specialty around here at Pointy Hat Industries. And through advanced and totally ethical testing, we swear, we have developed our tried and true recipe to make our own liches. Let's recap and see how that recipe can be applied to barbs. 1. Deliberately choose undeath. Liches are not whites. Undeath does not happen to them, they actively choose it. This basically makes them differently from nearly all other undead in DD. Zombies don't choose to be zombies, ghosts don't choose to be ghosts, vampires don't choose to be vampires. Unless they're into that. Drink. 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 I'm a vampire! I'm a vampire! You know what I mean. Becoming a lich is a conscious choice. Two, follow a ritual. Basically, turning into a lich is a process. The reason this isn't our recipe is because whenever you involve classes into anything, the first thought anyone will have is, can I become that during my fun, fantastical game of play pretend? Having a clear and concise path to achieve lichdom allows the answer to that question to be yes. And you want it to be yes. Bleak. Three, tied to a phylactery. A phylactery is basically a lich's undeath insurance. Liches tie their soul to a phylactery, or as experts in the field like to call it, a soul tupperware. If the lich is killed, it will come back to uh, on life as long as the phylactery is intact. A phylactery is usually a box, but it can be anything, and we tend to get very creative with our phylacteries here at Pointy Hat Enterprises, so strap in. And finally, four, lichdom is not passive. A lich has to actively work to keep unliving. This is a requirement in 5e for run-of-the-mill wizard liches, and I think it works fantastically well, because it ensures that the lich has goals to accomplish and is actively trying to get something. If undeath was just a one-and-done process, and the lich could chill for eternity in their spooky ooky tower of doom with a skull on top, playing predatory gacha games and becoming a discord mod, and other things that nerds would use on life to do, that would be a very boring and static villain and or NPC to unleash on your players. We want them out in the field, plotting and scheming, so that they can affect the story and change the status quo. And that's the point he had recipe. Now, did you notice something about it? Yes, exactly. Nowhere in there does it say that the Lich has to be a spellcaster. Yes, of course, traditionally they are, but I think we can make something very much feel like a Lich despite it not being able to cast spells. Just a different type of Lich. A Lich of gains. By straying away from the 100% natty path, barbarian Liches achieve massive alpha gains, but at what cost? In all seriousness, I do believe it can work and expand the definition of what a lich can be, which is the entire plot of this series. Barb. A barb? Barb. Yeah. What? Are you a barb? What is a barb? For this barbarian lich to work, we needed to both stick to the lich recipe we use around these parts, but also to make a barbarian's rage, the essence of the class, the essence of this lich as well. So what does that look like? Well, Rage is an extremely constricting ability. It requires you to attack or receive damage every turn, giving in to that whole Berserker Fury aspect of it. And the design of the class pushes you to Rage for as long as possible. That's a pretty grim setup if you think about it for like 5 seconds. So what if we leaned into that? What if we made something that can't stop hurting, both receiving and causing harm to others? Something that is literally unable to feel anything but anger. Let's go. It is said that anger destroys the soul, but it would be more accurate to say that it replaces it. Willingly giving into anger in such a way that it replaces all other feelings, dulling them until nothing but anger can be felt anymore, is the first and most important step in becoming a scourge. Of all methods to reach lichdom, the process to become a scourge is the least complex, but it's also the one where the resulting lich least resembles who they were before embracing on life. The first step in this path towards lichdom is to experience a blinding, searing rage for as long as possible. Those that wish to become a Scourge will train their anger like a skill, sharpening it like a blade, ensuring that every one of their thoughts is one of anger and hate. Whilst in this state, a scourge to be will endeavor to cultivate this rage and hatred not just within themselves, but also within others, as that is the only way that scourges can create their phylacteries. A Scourge Phylactery, often called a Vendetta, is any creature that deeply hates the Scourge. A part of the Scourge's soul lives on within the hatred that that Vendetta Phylactery feels against the Scourge. For as long as one creature viscerally hates the Scourge, the Scourge itself will come back to undeath if they're slain. Once the Scourge to be has completely replaced their own soul by rage, once it has filled the hearts of its vendettas with hate towards the Scourge, and once their body cannot physically take the strain of their own rage anymore, the mortal dies and the undead Scourge awakens and begins their death march. A Scourge's rage compels it to always march forward and to destroy anything in their path. Like a one-man horde, they will destroy entire towns that stand in their way, mercilessly mowing through its inhabitants, but always leaving survivors to cry for those killed by the walking Scourge. For those left behind are almost guaranteed to become new vendettas for the Scourge, ensuring its continued existence as the Scourge continues its death march like a stain upon the land contained to just one undying being. 
If the Scourge is slain, it will come back like its lich brethren, but through a very different process. The Scourge does not materialize next to a phylactery like other liches. Its method of continued on life is far more insidious. In the creation of a vendetta, a piece of the lich's soul lives within the anger that that vendetta feels for the Scourge. Upon a Scourge's death, that part of the Lich's soul will grow in power, feeding on the anger that the Vendetta feels for the Scourge, until that anger transforms into searing hatred and then blinding rage. It will then consume the Vendetta's soul completely and leave the body as an empty vessel for the Scourge's soul to take over, granting the Lich a new undead carcass with which to carry on its unending death march. That's cool, I think. And who said I couldn't write itchy? But seriously, think about it. At level 15, barbarians can already choose to never end their rage. And doesn't this feel both extremely barbarian and extremely lichy, lichesque, whatever. What is more barb than being fueled by rage, even in on life? Literally too angry to die. What is more lich than continuing your own life by consuming the souls of others? Except scourges don't just take the soul and put it in a blender, but rather destroy it with hatred and take the new body for themselves. Come on, you gotta admit that that's at least a little bit sick. But cool monster lore is worth nothing without ways to include it in your campaign. So how about we do that? Well, I can think of several ways to include a Scourge in your game, and I bet you can too, both as a player and as a DM. So how about we look at some of those? Let's start with a way that you, a player, can include the Scourge into your character's backstory. There is something ravaging the countryside. Some use the word Scourge to describe its ravages. Others use it for its definition related to lichdom. But most call it the Red Death because of the color that tints the towns it passes through. Leon was one of the few unlucky survivors that saw the Red Death paint a town red. His own town and his neighbors, friends, and family met the blade of the lone figure that is the Red Death. Leon was convinced he would join them too. But the Red Death steadied its blade right before striking him. He saw the empty flaming eyes fighting for control, barely containing the rage of the creature. And he was somehow spared from meeting the same fate as the rest of the town. Ever since, Leon has relentlessly trained day and night in the hopes of one day meeting with the Red Death again and finally enacting revenge for the slaughter it committed all those years ago. The Red Death is, of course, a scourge, and Leon now travels the world in search of the Lich to end its own life. Leon follows the trail of destruction left behind by the Red Death, meeting other survivors and learning their stories and sharing with them their need for revenge against the Red Death, trying to track the scourge and anticipate the next step on its death march. What Leon does not know is that the day he was spared by the Red Death is the day he became himself a vendetta a living phylactery to the thing he's now trying to kill. Okay, imagine the narrative arcs that a character like this could take part in. Maybe Leon does find the Red Death and does manage to kill it, only to start feeling how the anger inside of him hasn't been quelled by finally achieving revenge, but is only intensifying, making him erratic, violent, and dangerous. Will he find out that he's the living phylactery of the thing he killed before it consumes him? Maybe the second half of the campaign is about finding a way to destroy the piece of the Scourge's soul that now lives within him, and not just within him, but within everyone who was spared by the Red Death, as they are now phylacteries too. And before you know it, your silly little dragon fantasy game is now a story about the evils of living alive by the an eye for an eye rule. How easy it is to perpetuate a trauma cycle, and how personal trauma becomes generational trauma. Come on, I think it could be really cool! Okay, for our second example of integrating a scourge into your campaign, but from the DM side of the table, how about one where the party might actually benefit from a scourge coming to be? A small kingdom bordered by giants has been under the threat of invasion for decades. And now, invasion has stopped being a threat and has become a reality. One of those neighboring giants has launched a full-on attack against the small country, and war has started raging at its borders. The forces of the small nation cannot compete with the military might of the invaders. This doomed conflict has forced General Spinoza's hand, and that hand is now reaching towards nothing other than lichdom. General Spinoza has begun the process of turning herself into a scourge, with the assistance of the army and the blessing not only of the royal family, but the people of the kingdom. She is their last line of defense as invading forces ravage border towns daily and put their inhabitants to the sword. She'll use her desire to protect and avenge her kingdom as fuel for the righteous rage that will transform her into a scourge, literally becoming a one-woman army and the only hope of her nation. 
But for that, she needs to go into enemy territory and make vendettas to serve as her phylacteries. And she has requested the party's help in order to do so. General Spinoza's plan is the only thing that can save the kingdom from total annihilation. But will the party help her in her mission? What happens when the war is over and there aren't any fights left to fight? Will the solution create a worse problem down the line? Okay, think about it. The party gets to choose if they want to help Spinoza embarking on a war arc as they go past enemy lines and help her create phylacteries, getting to know her first, who she is as a person, and then seeing her descend into blinding rage as she comes closer and closer to fully transforming into a scourge. Or maybe they don't decide to help her at all, and now the party needs to find a way to predict Spinoza's attacks to prevent her from creating more phylacteries. What happens then? Does she turn towards her own countrymen and slaughter them? It will certainly make it easier to create vendettas then, and the party will be the ones that have forced her hand to do that. And if they refuse to help at all, they'll become number one enemies of a nation that is pleading for help as they've refused to help their only chance at salvation. It's a cool conflict! And if you want a big end of the arc or even end of campaign fight against the Scourge, there are so many ways to get there depending on what the party decides to do. So yeah, that's the Scourge. I mean, in concept, of course. It doesn't actually exist. Aside from in my smooth, smooth little hat brain. What's that? You're saying you want the full stat block for the Scourge? With legendary action. Oh, oh, and illustrated. <laughs> okay, that's it. I'm tired of these incessant demands from you people. Oh, I could just spit. Forgive my language, but how flipping double dare you? I could... Oh, it seems like my unending fiery rage has spontaneously created a full stat block for the Scourge. The Barbarian Lich, written and illustrated by me, and in the description of this very video for... 100% certified free. So go out there, skip those anger management courses, pop a blood vessel or two, paint one of those weird vein X shapes that anime characters get on their foreheads when they get mad, and achieve undeath by literally becoming too angry to die. And... Welcome to the end of the video! You made it, I made it, we made it. A brand new arrival to our little lichy family. I hope you all give a warm welcome to The Scourge. Honestly, real talk, I still have such a hard time believing that you people like this series so much. When I originally conceived it, I thought there was no chance in hell that this will take off because it was so specific and niche and it was about contradicting lore. And I just thought that based on the comments of people that get mad, if I don't know, I say that something is dumb in canon lore, this will never take off. And yet every single time I post a video, there's always comments asking for a new lich and nothing makes me happier because this one, this one is my favorite series. So thank you so much. As I said, I will keep doing it for as long as you people show support to the series. So if you like this series and you want it to continue, share it around. Tell your mom to watch it. Tell your dad to watch it. Tell your baker. Yep, that's my new recommendation for the day. Go bother your baker. Okay, enough. Uh, be sure to check in with yourself. Acknowledge your feelings. Allow yourself to feel them. And then find a way to deal with them in a productive way. <laughs> <laughs> well, way too real, way too real for the silly advice at the end of the video. Abort, abort. I'm leaving now. Bye, 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 bye. Mwah.